On the 3rd of April 2019, the Legislative Council of Hong Kong first introduced the extradition bill, which would allow for criminal suspects to be potentially extradited to China, sparking months of turbulent protests across Hong Kong. As the 2047 deadline draws near, the time has come to ask, is independence a possibility for Hong Kong? And can these divisions between the protesting voices and the pro-Beijing establishment ever be reconciled? Where does the future lie for Hong Kong? To join me in answering these questions, we have Nathan Law, a Hong Kong political activist and politician who was a student leader in the 2014 Umbrella Movement. He served on the Hong Kong Legislative Council until his disqualification in 2017. We also have Eddie Chu, a social activist and politician who founded the Land Justice League, a conservationist pro-democracy group, and was elected to the Legislative Council of Hong Kong in 2016. Nathan, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us here today. It is a pleasure to have you. Um, I wanted to jump right in with some questions about um, the history of protest and the pro-independence movement in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong has had a very distinct, a very independent, proud identity from mainland China ever since the 1997 handover. And the protest and protest is not something that are new to Hong Kong. Um, so Nathan, I wanted to go to you, um, given that you were a student leader in the Umbrella Movement in 2014, to ask about how the years before prepared you and prepared young people for the 2019 protest. Well, um, I think, uh, first of all, we have to recognize uh, the differences in between Hong Kong and China, which we have a relatively free um, way of life, that we enjoy a freedom of assembly to a certain degree that we host um, protests every year. Well, on the 1st of July, we, we have been having um, large rallies every year and uh, the turn number has been great. And that is in our blood, like protesting it is something that we have been always um, doing when we wanted to express our own opinion. So um, I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, there had been uh, massive protests in the past few years is because we witnessed um, the distortion and the uh, deterioration of one country two system, which the major motto, the Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong and also the high degree of autonomy uh, are not being um, exercised uh, in practices. So we, we have witnessed a lot of um, well uh, policies or um, intrusions of freedom happened in the past few years. And we have witnessed um, some major events like um, the, the kidnapping of the Causeway Bay booksellers uh, and also um, the implementation of the August 31st decision of the white paper that basically killed democracy for Hong Kong. So um, these made Hong Kong people furious because in 1997, when the uh, section happened, uh, Hong Kong people were promised with uh, autonomy and democracy, but 20 years after that, uh, we have nothing left. So I think that is something that made Hong Kong people so angry and they marched down to the street and uh, the 2014 and 2019 protests happened on this uh, historical background. Based on that then, in 2019, um, the protests started, um, as you said, on this historical background, but what specifically was it about the extradition bill that triggered them. Eddie, I wanted to go to you specifically to ask what it was about the extradition bill that drove you as a conservationist out to the streets to protest. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about the extradition ordinance, uh, why it was so unpopular uh, to Hong Kong citizens, uh, we need to know that there is a clear uh, uh, separation between the legal system of mainland China and uh, Hong Kong as a special administrative region. We, we have our own judici judiciary and we have our own court of final appeal. And before uh, this extradition bill was introduced, uh, it was uh, written in another law that uh, no criminals or suspect uh, should be extradited uh, from Hong Kong to mainland China uh, uh, for trial. Because uh, if that is the case, then uh, there will be um, uh, unpleasant or unwanted meddling uh, between the two judicial systems. 
That's why when uh, Hong Kong SAL government introduced this uh, ordinance, uh, we thought it was an order from Beijing uh, in order to uh, counteract uh, the US and use Hong Kong as a place uh, to maybe uh, arrest somebody and then extradite uh, he or she to mainland China. Um, so to talk then a bit about the protests themselves, the protests were led widely by young people in a very kind of distinct democratic way in the sense that they played out on social media, they were organized not by one leader who had this cult around them, but by several voices who supported each other using essentially tools such as social media. Um, so I wanted to ask, does, do you think that this kind of innovative form of protesting has led to the creation of a new identity within Hong Kong, um, which is supported by things like art and culture that has come out of these protests? And how do you think this creation of a new identity will impact um, future prospects for Hong Kong? Does it mean that people will be more inclined to break away from um, this, this connection to the mainland even more? So Nathan, going to you. Well, definitely um, the form of protest uh, for the past few months, um, we call it leaderless or full of leaders because we, we don't really have a heritual existence of, of some leading pack or some leading alliance. Like people uh, have been using their creativity and uh, the, the advantages of social platforms to organize themselves and then play out in every single role that they could imagine in order to expand the influence of the protest. So I think um, that's definitely actually, actually a scholarly um, uh, uh, well project uh, that should be uh, delved into deeply in the future. And I think like for the past few months, we could really see the, how tenacious Hong Kong people have been in terms of really fighting for their future freedom and democracy. Because um, for, uh, like the response from the central government has always been really staunch and really conservative and hawkish. And they deny all the demands from the protesters and try to um, stigmatize launching huge smear campaign in mainland China and try to flame them as much as they can. And uh, for the protesters, when they encounter such a response, of course, they feel isolated. They feel inf they, they are infuriated. And uh, therefore, there are lots of, um, well, um, understandings that uh, Beijing could never um, give something to them that um, they have promised like democracy and freedom. Therefore, um, a sense of uh, detachment will breed. And uh, forms of arts like songs, that there's been a really popular song like Glory to Hong Kong that resembles our demands for democracy and freedom. Uh, so flags and all the artifacts uh, actually enhance or strengthen that sense of belonging uh, attached uh, uh, locally. And um, so a, a strong sense of Hong Kongers that um, is detached from uh, like the Chinese-ness has been um, generated in the process. So I think that, that is something that uh, made Hong Kong people uh, really um, like stick together and then um, generate such a huge movement that um, shocked the world. What do you think then this distinct Hong Kongness means for the future of peace in Hong Kong and, recon and reconciling divisions between kind of potentially a more pro-Beijing older generation or more pro-Beijing establishment versus a very um, ferociously independent younger generation? How, do you think that these divisions can be bridged? Well, I think like, first of all, that, that there are certain demands in, in, in the five demands that the protester brought up gained a huge consensus in the society. There are more, more than 80% of uh, the people in Hong Kong, uh, they agree that there should be an independent investigative body on the police brutality and also um, implementing democracy. So these are actually consensus of the popular mass. But the point is, if the government is not taking proactive measure to um, promise that there are possibilities that they will do or they will act in accordance to this demand, that 
it is really difficult for for the protesters to say that oh we're going to give up or we're going to have a talk to you and we could resolve it in a peaceful manner because the government has been like refusing to do so and um this like um highly legitimized and supported uh demands shall be the things that the government acts up on in case that they are um acting on behalf of the people and for the people so if the government uh is still following the hawkish um path um well brought up by the central government then um i think the re reconciliation is difficult to happen and um the international community should, should act proactively to say that oh actually the, the, the consensus for your population is really clear and you should really listen to them and do something to resolve that because um well to be honest uh if we continue the situation it, it do not it, it does not good for all the parties so the government should take a protect, proactive role to resolve that so one of the key things that's kind of arisen in this discussion is um, this idea that the government has not done enough um, so eddie i wanted to go to you um, to ask what do you think that the government doing enough looks like what would you like to see in terms of tangible uh, legislative conversations or actions um, which will signify the government listening to the five demands that the protesters have laid forward? I think uh, Hong Kong people have been very clear in its political demand, uh, but unfortunately since uh, 2014, uh, the central government declared that there will be no universal suffrage uh, without political censorship. And that uh, pushed the relationship of uh, Hong Kong people and mainland China into a deadlock, a zero-sum game. And so we, we are consistent with our uh, demands, uh, but uh, I, I have, um, I, I have uh, no point to be uh, hopeful that uh, the, the Beijing are going to uh, concede uh, in any time soon. Uh, as we as, as we all know, uh, we are now on the contrary facing a deepening uh, intervention uh, from Beijing. Uh, just one of my colleagues uh, is going to be disqualified as legislator simply because uh, he is facilitating filibustering uh, within the council. So to understand um, this pressure and this kind of oppression that comes from Beijing, um, you, Nathan, um, as well, have had negative experiences as a legislative yourself with your disqualification in 2017. Um, could you tell us a bit about the political mechanisms used by Beijing or the pro-Beijing establishment to suppress the voices of protesters, especially when they make it as far as the legislature? Yeah, like um, Beijing has been basically tearing apart the well-established system that Hong Kong, um, well, have been built up on. And then uh, they're using uh, the rule of law or rule by law in their terms to persecute um, political activists that they don't like. For me personally, I have encountered some of the cases that really shocked the legal sector and the international legal community and many legal scholars commended that um, these are like purely political, political persecution on activists. In 2016, as I was elected as the youngest ever legislator in Hong Kong Legislative, Legislative Council at the age of 23, but after I served nine months in the council, um, uh, the courts uh, ruled, uh, well, uh, a verdict that um, basically disqualified um, me myself uh, because a technicality issue in my oath sharing ceremony, and they, they, uh, the court based on the reinterpretation that issue that that was issued um, in November 2016 um, that retrospectively um, acted on uh, the oath sharing oath sharing ceremony that took place on in the October of 2016. So you could see uh, the, the government, the central government had the power of um, explaining the, the mini constitution of Hong Kong basic law 
in order to set a legal trap on um, the well, whatever the political artifice or legislators back then, and then to disqualify them to foil uh, all the mandate that they received in the democratic election. And also I was uh, uh, jailed uh, a month after my disqualification regarding to my participation in the umbrella movement. So you could see like um, the, the government have been um, issuing a lot of uh, different intervention into our local system and Beijing has been utilizing their power in uh, the legal system and in the executive system to suppress um, dissidents in Hong Kong and uh, throw them in jail or kick out people uh, from the council wherever they don't like. Um, and these are sort of proof that the autonomy of Hong Kong has been um, diminished and attacked. And uh, that is something that inter the inter international community to really um, focus on. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, you've talked about all the difficulties that, um, that the protesters and the pro-democracy movement has had in permeating the legal structures and the legislative structures of Hong Kong. But there have still been some significant electoral successes, especially in the recent past with the November 2019 District Council elections. Um, so, Eddie, if you could tell us a bit about the, the backdrop um, in, behind which these elections happened and how the and what these elections mean for the future of the movement. Uh, in the uh, democratic movement of Hong Kong, uh, election uh, has been uh, a major uh, battlefield uh, from both sides. And because it, we inherited a system of um, semi-democratic system uh, from uh, the British colonial era. And uh, although uh, the democratic camp uh, have uh, the majority uh, support of the people uh, due to uh, a special, a specially uh, designed system to favor uh, Beijing's candidate, uh, we up till now uh, uh, had only uh, uh, managed to have uh, one third, close to one third of the seats in the Legislative Council. And <clears throat> what surprised uh, us all uh, in the last uh, District Council election uh, was that it, it was the first time uh, since uh, the establishment of the Council that uh, the Democratic camp uh, managed to uh, win a uh, majority in uh, 17 out of 18 of the council. And that uh, was a um, huge blow uh, to uh, Beijing uh, when it's trying to tell the world that the Hong Kong people uh, did not like uh, the democratic movement, did not, did not like the anti extradition uh, campaign. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Beijing is now uh, learning from uh, this defeat, uh, trying to uh, regroup itself and to make uh, uh, harsher uh, ordinance and uh, disqualification uh, red line in order to stop, I think, uh, the majority uh, within uh, the democratic camp to even enter into the Legislative Council election. So. Uh, this is the way uh, the Communist Party is dealing with uh, election. It uh, only uh, allows election that it can uh, foresee the results. Mm -hmm. So just to touch on um, this legal, um, legal kind of attack that Beijing keeps um, improving at every stage, um, do you think there is a way for the pro-democracy movement to counter this attack just as effectively? What additional resources do you think the movement needs in order to be able to successfully break this attack? Yeah, first of all, of course, we need to have a street movement. We need to have uh, protesters in order to keep the presence and pressure on the government. And also, as uh, what Eddie just said, uh, the council is also a major battlefield that we need to honor uh, all the resources that we have and then to present how ridiculous the government is within the council. And uh, the international community is also uh, well important field 
that we need to fight for support because uh, the autonomy of Hong Kong has always been the foundation of uh, its special economic status, which separates um, its uh, economic operation from the ones in China. And it actually offered a lot of leverage and advantages for the Chinese government to see Hong Kong as white glove, to use it uh, for its own pur purpose. And um, Hong Kong plays an Im important role in China's economy. So if uh, China has been um, infringing Hong Kong's autonomy and its um, status as a whole has been um, uh, infringing its freedom and uh, human rights, the international community should stand up and say that if you want to destroy Hong Kong's autonomy, then you will lose the golden the, the, the goose that laid golden egg for you. And uh, from doing so, um, the international community could balance the power that China exerts in Hong Kong locally and then try to ask it to respect uh, the rule of law, uh, the separation of power, and the one country, two system that um, has been operating in Hong Kong. So I think um, in these three layers, if we could garner uh, as much support as we can, then we may have a chance to ask Beijing and to force them to really listen to the demands of people. What does pressure from the international community look like? What do you expect um, the international community to do? Um, and where do you expect this response to come specifically from? Um, well, I think um, last year, the, at the end of last year, um, the US Congress has passed uh, the um, US, um, him, uh, the, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which actually put pressure to the Chinese government saying that um, you need to respect the autonomy of Hong Kong, otherwise you will lose a lot of economic interest. And I think that is um, something that we need to duplicate in some other countries because uh, the autonomy of Hong Kong has always been the cornerstone of our success. And uh, the fruit of our success has been reaped not only by China, but also shared by the international community. And well, each country, they, they also have stakes in Hong Kong. So I think uh, it is important to say that we need to connect the, the degree of autonomy and the degree of um, the economic uh, success in Hong Kong so that we could preserve both, but not losing both. So I think that is something that the other countries and the international community to act upon and urge the Chinese government to honor the international treaty that they signed, the sino British Joint Declaration, to offer Hong Kong autonomy and democracy. Final question from me before we take some questions from the audience. Um, Eddie, I wanted to ask you, um, do you feel optimistic about the future of peace in Hong Kong? Um, and Nathan, you can answer after as well. Um, do you feel like there is a way for Hong Kong to be a cohesive, peaceful society again in the near future? Well, uh, I am not optimistic at all, but at the same time, uh, we clearly realize that we are uh, in uh, in a moment of big change. Uh, as everybody is predicting, uh, after, uh, uh, after this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, we foresee there is a new confrontation between uh, the West and the China on uh, where to lay the responsibility of this whole pandemic. And I think that gives uh, the whole world to uh, reveal its relationship uh, with China. And I think uh, 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 countries in the West should put uh, Hong Kong's issue uh, uh, in this context and to support uh, Hong Kong's uh, fight for democracy because I think uh, in, in, the, in the future, Hong Kong uh, will be very important in deciding uh, the future of uh, China because uh, when you are having a new so-called uh, new policy of containment to China, then Hong Kong will certainly be used again uh, by China as uh, its window to the world.
and 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 then uh, how to influence uh, uh, the way of development of this window is, I think, a crucial task uh, for uh, the West. Well, um, I I share the, the the kind of like protection uh, with uh, Eddie, and uh, I'm not optimistic at all. But I think um, like for for us uh, the the way that we project our future actually um, kind of like mobilize us to fight harder because if we don't act, then well, Hong Kong will be falling to a deep embassy and um, none of us could really get what we want and survive in, in this lack of democracy and freedom. So I think um, that kind of like uh, prediction actually became uh, a sense of mobilization for us and uh, really uh, making us to be very staunch in protecting our Hong Kong. Okay, thank you so much for that. We will now turn to our questions that we have pre um, collected from our audience. First, we have a question from Ching at St. Cross College, um, who says, without mutual trust and respect to the basic law, whether it is a perceived or real threat, as highlighted by the extradition bill, and the liaison office claiming not to be governed by basic law rule 22 how should hong kong position itself internationally eddie if you take that one uh well i think uh, uh this question uh has given us uh, uh, a very uh, clear picture of what we are facing uh we are having a constitution that is not uh, agreed by the people and can be amended or reviewed uh, according to the wish of a dictatorship. That means uh, every rice uh, so-called enshrined uh, by the basic law is a horse altogether. And that is what's, what's happening now. Why the liaison office can uh, self-claim uh, to be the supervisor uh, of the SAL, SAL government is because, well, uh, they can interpret uh, the basic law according to their wish. And, and, and if we are, so when, we, when, when you talk about uh, how can we position uh, um, our situation internationally, we can position ourselves as, uh, as a place that is uh, under authoritarian rule and and with our basic rights uh, being threatened every day and so we need to i mean um join hands with the fight uh, against authoritarian rule uh, uh with the people that are suffering from it well um i think like for us we are definitely at the forefront of the clashes of two values uh, the liberal democracy and the authoritarianism and we could see the ambition of the expansionist nature of the Chinese authoritarianism that they wanted to um, um, export their influence through like one bell one road and, and the other mega projects and to create a pre uh, well to create a falsified um, f future that well um, liberal democracy is not working again and I think it is our collective responsibility to halt that and to say that um, democracy is something that all human beings um, deserve. And the battleground in Hong Kong is uh, what plays a very significant role in um, emphasizing that. So I think the success of Hong Kong fighting for democracy is not only uh, in the interest of Hong Kong, but in the interest of the world and liberal democracy as a whole. So we should fight together collectively and with uh, the international support. Um, our next question is from Dominic at St. Bennett, and it touches on, um, I suppose, the trade-off between protest and economic um, progress. Um, and he asks, will the instability and uncertainty of Hong Kong protests cause the city to lose its status as one of the financial capitals of the world, and with it, some power to resist Beijing? Well, I think the only factor that could lead the loss of um, financial center, the, the status of financial center would be a complete loss of autonomy, which for Hong Kong people and protesters, we can never uh, do it because we, we're not entitled, we're not, we, we don't have the right 
to like destroy the autonomy of Hong Kong, and that can only be done by the central government. So uh, our previous ac uh, previous action actions clearly our aim is to preserve the autonomy that we have, and then uh, the international community could honor that and and the special economic status that Hong Kong have been um, enjoying. So I think um, yeah, that is exactly the way that we wanted to avoid the worst situation in Hong Kong, and then we could thrive as a, a financial center in the future with the preservation of autonomy. It is, it is uh, the wish, it is the wish of uh, Beijing government uh, to, on one hand, uh, tighten its rule uh, on Hong Kong, and at the same time, enjoy the benefit uh, from financial activities uh, of Hong Kong. But I think, well, to make, uh, a successful financial center, you need to have freedom of speech, you need to have uh, a rule of law, and you need to have uh, uh, political rights uh, being respected. So you, China government, Chinese government, just can't have it both. And I think the international world knows very much about it. So it worries about the future of Hong Kong. If uh, China force us uh, into its uh, wish to turn it into an authoritarian financial center. Well, this is uh, in, a, an impossible combination and we will not let it to happen. Great. I think that is a very, very powerful note for us to end on today. Thank you so much for joining us, Eddie and Nathan. It has been a pleasure to host you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.